city where the boys are tough and the girls were pretty. Nighttime, I blew my workers all through. The radio was tuned into red hot and blue. The man it was great just to be alive. Memphis in the night. Hi, I'm Mike Freeman. We're going to do a tour of Elvis's Memphis. That's what I do. I show people the city that Elvis uh, grew up in and learned his craft. We're here on historic Beale Street here in Memphis, Tennessee, home of the blues. And Elvis was important to Memphis. You can tell by the statue. And Memphis was important to Elvis. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the places that were important to his life. We're going to talk to some folks who knew Elvis. We're going to visit Elvis's favorite clothing store where he found pink and blacks that he loved to wear. We're going to visit uh, Poplar Tunes, his favorite record store. We're going to visit the Overton Park Shell where the girls screamed for the first time. We're going to visit Lardell Courts where he was poor. And then we're going to visit Audubon Drive where he was rich. These are all important places to, uh, to Elvis here in Memphis and you're going to see them very soon. You can see behind me is the statue of Elvis. Yeah, as you can guess, Elvis is very important to Memphis. And after he died, to put the statue here to, what can I say, commemorate his life. Also to bring tourists to downtown Memphis. Elvis is like a magnet. He draws people in and the city officials knew that. So they wanted an Elvis statue on Beale. Okay, we're going to leave the uh, statue here in Elvis Presley Plaza on Beale Street. We're going to walk over to the Orpheum Theater where Elvis used to watch movies. And uh, we're going to go to Jim's Barbershop. I'm going to tell you an Elvis haircut story. So off we go. We just left Beale Street. We're here at Main and Beale. Kind of a rainy day out. Not raining yet. We're in front of the Orpheum Theater, which at one time was called the Malco. And this is a very old theater, uh, the oldest in Memphis these days. A lot of vaudeville, live shows. Today we get a lot of Broadway shows here. Yeah, there's a great photograph of Elvis standing under the marquee of this theater in 1956. It says Malco then, not Orpheum. And he was here in the early days watching movies. Uh, you know, after he became famous in 1956, it was impossible for him to watch a movie during the daytime business hours, so he'd rent it at night. Now, next to the front door of the theater on the left was Jim's Barbershop. And I have a great picture of Elvis getting his hair cut in 1956. And I actually met the barber years later. It was just out of the blue, he tells me his Elvis story. He was cutting my hair and he was telling me that uh, Elvis got his hair cut and then after Elvis paid his fare and walked away, he, the man couldn't sweep the floor of hair clippings because all the teenagers rushed in and picked up the hair. And this guy was telling me this 30 years later. <laughs> it was his most memorable moment in his barbering career. <laughs> You know, there was a lot of famous people that performed in this theater down through the years, but the most famous, quote, resident of this theater is actually a ghost. Uh, we, no one knows why Mary is in this theater, but she does show up. She likes to go backstage and appear to certain performers, and she has her favorite seat in the theater. She's actually one of Memphis's favorite ghosts. A lot of you probably don't know that Elvis actually worked in a movie theater here on Main Street. He was a movie usher, believe it or not. So we're gonna to walk to that place right now and we'll tell you those stories. Well, obviously this is not the theater, but it used to be here. It was called Lowe State Theater. And in 1950, when Elvis was uh, 15 years old, he worked as a movie usher. And friends tell me that Elvis loved that job because he could sit in the theater and watch the movies over and over again, study Tony Curtis, how did he dye his hair. Uh, he would always study the lead actors and how they performed on stage. So he was 
trying to be something, an entertainer, at a very early age. Unfortunately, he didn't keep the job very long. He got in a fight with another boy, and Mr. Groom fired them both. So he was here maybe a few months. That would be the end of the story, except that in 1956, Elvis's first movie premieres at Lowe State Theater. Mr. Groom is still on the job, and Elvis didn't hold a grudge. There's no hard feelings between them at this movie premiere. And in fact, Mr. Groom's theater made a lot of money that day, that week. Love Me Tender was the second grossing movie of the, in America in 1956. Now, the next year, Jailhouse Rock premieres at the same theater. Mr. Groom's on the job. And the newspapers begged Elvis to have his photograph taken with his old boss. So I have a copy of it. It's a great picture. Elvis is holding his movie usher's uniform. Mr. Groom is on the other side. And the caption reads, gee, you have your old job back anytime you want it. And Elvis's response was, thanks, but I don't think I need it right now, which is the understatement of the century, I believe. So now we're going to leave Main Street and go back to Beale. We're going to go to uh, the clothing store, actually the, the location of the clothing store where Elvis bought his favorite pink and black outfits. And we're going to do a little walk down Beale Street. So follow me. You know, Hollywood has its walk of fame. Well, Memphis has its musician's walk of fame. And I'm standing right above the musical note for Johnny Cash. And then later on, I'll show you the musical note for Elvis Presley. We're here on famous Beale Street again. It's second in Beale. And this building used to be a clothing store called Lansky's. We'll talk more about Lansky's a little bit later in our, in our show. And this is where uh, Elvis would buy his uh, favorite clothing, the pink and blacks. You know, you probably don't know that Beale Street was once the downtown for the black community. I described this in my book, Memphis Elvis Style. The black people would shop here and the white people would not. The white people would shop on Main Street and very few white people would come to Beale Street just to shop and look around. But Elvis, as a teenager, was the exception. He actually liked Beale Street. He would come into stores like Lansky's because he liked the styles of the clothing that the black people would wear, the, the pink and blacks, the outlandish clothing. And uh, the kids in his high school made fun of Elvis because he dressed so weird because they didn't like wearing that kind of stuff. You know, Elvis must have been brave to walk into school dressed so different from the other kids. But at an early age, he set himself to be different, appear different, came down to Beale Street when no other kid in his white kid would do that. He set himself at an early age to be different. And I bet that's one of the reasons why we remember Elvis today, because he certainly was different. We're gonna walk down Beale Street ourselves. Our next stop will be where Elvis hung out with B.B. King. So come on, follow me. Before we go to where Elvis met B.B. King, we're going to go into the Club Superior. Come inside and I'll tell you why. We are here in the basement of the Club Superior. And as you can see, it is filled with some uh, mementos, photos of Elvis Presley. This is part of a collection from uh, my friend Anna. And you can, here's a picture of uh, Elvis with Anita Wood, signed by Anita Wood, not too many years ago. A uh, picture of one of my favorite people, that's Elvis with Richard Davis, who passed away, unfortunately, three years ago. And here is a copy of uh, the Memphis City School certificate from Hume's Junior High. And that's really the theme of this collection, Elvis's school, 
Humes, which was both a junior high and senior high in those days. You can see a wonderful class picture, a little bit small. L.C. Humes High School class of 1953. And Elvis is in the picture. He's not wearing the pink and black. <laughs> He's in a basic uh, jacket and tie, just like the other guys. And Elvis is just one, a, a kind of a face in the crowd here. He wasn't a star athlete. He wasn't the most popular guy in school. Didn't belong to a lot of clubs. Uh, the most popular guy at Humes at that time was class president George Klein, whom we're going to meet later in this show. This room is filled with memorabilia of uh, Humes High School from the students, from the school itself. You know, look at these walls just covered with, uh, with items from the school. See ya. Thank you. We're leaving the Club Superior now. We're going to go down to see where Elvis met B.B. King. So follow me down Beale Street. Okay, Elvis met B.B. King, well, in a lot of places, to be honest with you. But there's a great photograph of Elvis arm in arm with B.B. King in 1956 at the Palace Theater. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist anymore. Behind me is a place called Pat O'Brien's, you can see it, and that's where the theater was. Elvis was backstage. He was watching black performers like B.B. King do a charity show. And B.B. King says that Elvis turned to him and, and thanked B.B. King for, uh, I guess, the musical lessons or just the experience of watching guys like B.B. King perform. There's uh, several great pictures of Elvis in that theater. There's one with Rufus Thomas, another black performer that was uh, famous in Memphis music history. Okay, on my right is a statue of W.C. Handy, and he is known as the father of the blues. What he did was he wrote the first blues songs almost a century ago, two generations before Elvis. And up until about the year 1956, he was the most famous musician to ever live in Memphis, Tennessee. Of course, we now know who the most famous one is today. And I remember I told you about the musical notes on Beale Street. Well, Elvis does have a musical notes. It's to the left of me here at Alfred's. Uh, Elvis has a note next to the notes of two of his closest friends, George Klein and Jerry Schilling. All right, Beale Street's jumping at lunchtime. We're going to get uh, off of Beale Street now. We're going to get in my van. We're going to go a little bit south of here to the old Chiska Hotel. That's where Elvis's songs were played on the radio for the first time back in 1954. We're going to tell you some stories about a guy you may have heard of. His name was Dewey Phillips. Beale Street is behind me. Here's the van, so let's go. Yeah, we've got to use a car to get around Memphis. You know, this city's not just is not built for walking. Most of the places are scattered out. You just got to drive from one to the next. This isn't New York. I know you can walk from one place to the next there. Main Street, South Main, not far from Beale Street. Behind me is the Hotel Chiska, or what's left of it. It's the last of the abandoned buildings on South Main Street. The rest of this area looks pretty good these days. Now this is famous in rock and roll history is where Elvis's records were broadcast on radio for the first time. WHBQ is a radio station. They had the uh, first floor of the hotel and the famous disc jockey was Dewey Phillips. No relation to Sam, but just as crazy. And Dewey had a show called Red Hot and Blue, and he played rhythm and blues music, whatever he wanted, on the radio. And then one fateful day in July 1954, Sam gave to Dewey a record, an acetate, and says, play it, I want to see what people think. I think this kid's good. And uh, Dewey did. And what do you know, they had all these phone calls, they had 15 requests to play the song again that night. 
Dewey decided on the spot that he had to interview this new artist, this Elvis Presley, because no one knew who Elvis was. So the phone call went to the Presley household and Elvis was brought down. He was to the radio station to be interviewed. He was 19. He'd never been on radio before. He'd never done anything before as far as the entertainment world. And he was also very nervous. So Dewey actually tricked Elvis into his first radio interview. They were doing a conversation and Elvis didn't realize that the microphone was on instead of off. So that's how that first interview was done. And then of course the rest is history. That song was That's Alright Mama. That launched Elvis's career. Well, you know, after that uh, first uh, night, Dewey and Elvis became friends. And then Elvis would go up to the radio station and talk to Dewey, maybe play a song or two. And really, so did all the other Sun Records artists that you're familiar with today, Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, and many, many more. They all went up to Dewey to get that magic, to get that hit record. And Dewey could help them get that here in Memphis. Things began to change in 1956. Let's face it, Elvis was becoming famous. Well, Dewey told his radio audience, hey, come on up and watch Elvis perform with the band, his new song. And in those days, you could watch the disc jockey and the musicians through plate glass windows. Unfortunately, every teenager in Memphis decided to go to the Peabody Hotel that night. That's what it seemed. And the hotel management called the police, exits were blocked, and they had to bring Elvis out of service elevator and around the corner to make his escape. This was Elvis mania, so it happened here. And uh, it's kind of sad too, because the old days were gone. It was, it was harder for Elvis to do simple things with his friends, like hang out at the radio station. Okay, from records on the radio being played, now we're gonna go where the records were sold. And that shop still exists. It's called Poplar Tunes, Poplar Avenue in the north side of downtown. So let's go to it right now. We've just left where Elvis's records were played on radio for the first time. Now let's come in the store and see where they were sold for the first time. Come on in, let's buy a record together. The really neat thing about this store is that it hasn't changed that much. We're in the same building that Elvis would have come inside here to shop. Records, same walls, same floor, same ceiling. And this is the first place to ever sell an Elvis Presley record. And one of the, one of the things that the owners of the record store would do was hold autograph parties for the Sun Records artists. So the new 45 came out, they'd have a table set up, and you, and you the teenage fan, can come in here and have your buy your record and have it autographed by Elvis, or maybe next week Carl Perkins. And that was, it must have been fun to live in Memphis in those days. We have a picture on the wall here of Elvis inside the store. This is probably about 1957, judging by Elvis's hair. It's dyed black. And the man in the middle is Dewey Phillips. We just talked about him, the disc jockey. We used to promote his radio show here and do re remote broadcasts from the store. You can see his signs there in the backgrounds. And the third man in the photograph is Joe Coogie, who uh, no one could pronounce his name right. I said Joe Cooey, Dewey said Joe Cocky. But anyway, he was one of the founders of this record store and he was friends with all the, the musicians and the record producers in this town. And that's why so much of the activity took place inside this store. Now, a little insert in the big picture is a smaller picture. It's actually Elvis in the store browsing for records. These days this shop has CD racks. Of course in those days it was album racks, which I think are more fun. Now for the fans coming here today, what you can do is have your picture made with Elvis and Dewey and Joe. Right down there, just insert your face in there, do a little cropping, a little bit of Adobe magic, and you can say you were here with Elvis and Dewey back in the day. You know, there's so many Elvis places in this part of Memphis, the north side of Memphis, just outside the Poplar Tunes door across the street uh, is a gas station today. In the old days, that was the location of Crown Electric, Elvis's last real job before that entertainment career took off. And as you probably know the story, he used to drive a delivery truck for Crown, delivering parts to the electricians on the job. And uh, there's a neat headline, 1956, former truck driver is now a millionaire. It's about Elvis's rise from minimum wage truck driver to entertainment star. 
All right, our next site, we're going to go back to North Main. We're going to look at the old auditorium location where Elvis performed back in 1955 and 1956. So follow me. Come on. We are here in front of the new Cannon Center for Performing Arts and it replaced an older building called Ellis Auditorium. And when Elvis was alive, of course, he performed at the old auditorium, Ellis Auditorium. He first performed here in 1955, then again in 1956. 1961, he did two shows for Memphis Charities and that was one of the few shows he did live in the 1960s. Elvis also watched shows here. He was a big fan of gospel music. He loved uh, all kinds of gospel music. And the Blackwood Brothers Gospel Quartet would organize what they call gospel music sings on Saturday nights. And Elvis would watch shows here, usually from backstage. Of course, when he was famous, he didn't want to disrupt the show, so he would be backstage. But uh, before fame, he would come here, and there's a cute story that uh, now deceased J.D. Sumner would tell uh, that Elvis would come to the shows and pay the 50 cent admission and then one week he missed and then the following week he was back and uh, J.D. asked why weren't you here and Elvis replied I didn't have the 50 cent admission and of course J.D. says well you can come in free from now on. And it's an interesting story because even at that young age these uh, singers were kind of paying attention to Elvis. They noticed something about him that was a little different from the average fan. You know, the first book I wrote was called The Best of Elvis, and it was a, a compilation of stories about Elvis's generosity, good deeds, donations to charity. And we started off the book with an award ceremony. Elvis received this award in 1971 for the JCs. It was called The Ten Most Outstanding Young Men of America. And that happened to be his favorite award of all the things he was given through his life. He really prized that award more than any other. Because to him, it signified not just his entertainment career, but it was also given to him in honor of his charitable work. And he thought that was very special, and he kept that award with him all his life. We're standing at the side of the old Ellis Auditorium where Elvis received the 10 Most Outstanding Young Men of America Award. And he gave this cute little speech, which you've probably seen in video, or and I can't recite it for you, but it was a very short three minute speech where he said that all his dreams had come true a hundred times. You know, Elvis uh, gave a lot to local charities here, and the, probably the most famous charitable organization in Memphis is St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, which is not far from here. So I thought we'd go there now and talk about that. So come on, let's go. Let's get back in the van. It's just a short drive to St. Jude from the Ellis Auditorium location really one of the oldest parts of the city, though it's kind of hard for you to tell because so much of it's gone. Here we are in front of world-famous St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And this was founded by Danny Thomas, who was a television actor, entertainer, prominent in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And the interesting thing is Danny put his hospital here in Memphis even though he didn't live in this town. He really had kind of an indirect tie to Memphis. Uh, Danny founded this hospital out of religious conviction and his favorite priest was a native of Memphis. So when Danny uh, approached this man with the idea of starting a hospital, the suggestion was made, why don't you do it here in Memphis? Uh, the hometown of his of the priest. So here we are today in front of Danny's Hospital, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, which is really more of a research center is, than just a hospital. Now Elvis donated money to St. Jude, but in a very interesting way. He didn't simply hand a check to Danny and said, "Here you go." 
What Elvis did was he bought the presidential yacht, President Roosevelt's yacht. It was due to be scrapped and Elvis didn't want that. But he also didn't want the boat itself. So he searched for a charity or, or some entity to take the yacht and he settled on Danny Thomas's new hospital. I think the doors had just opened and Danny was always raising money. So the two got together and it was agreed that Danny would take possession of the yacht and he would sell it and then take that cash and put it into his hospital. And that's what they did. So we're going to leave St. Jude Children's Hospital. We're going to make a short trip to the Arcade Restaurant, the oldest restaurant in Memphis and one of Elvis's favorite places to eat. We're about to go inside the Arcade Restaurant. As you can see from this marker here, it is a historic place. We're going to do a little talk with Harry Zapata. He's a third generation owner of the arcade. So come on in with me. Well, Harry, tell us a little bit about your restaurant here. Okay. Uh, my grandfather had three restaurants when World War I was uh, breaking out, and he sold all of them to go join up. Oh. He's an immigrant from Cephalonia, Greece. He was born in 1895, and uh, he went to war and did his duty, and then came back and bought the arcade restaurant. Uh, at that time, it was uh, the early part of 1919, and it was a one-story, wood frame, pot belly stove deal, real small place. And uh, business was good. There were two train stations, one on this end of us, one on that end. I guess it's the same as being in the Northwest Terminal at the airport. That's right, right the, in the uh, heart of it. Oh, it's just people everywhere. Um, that building was torn down in 1925 and they built the building that's here right now. Um, originally, at that time, and we've got plans and so forth for this, it was to be a seven-story hotel on top of the building. Really? Uh-huh. The, the, uh, the concrete walls in the basements are 18 to 24 inches thick. He, uh, he, he, named the, uh, he named the restaurant the Arcade, and the idea was to have other tenants in the building selling different wares and so forth and so on, clothes shops, gifts, and that kind of thing. Uh, I guess when I was a kid growing up, just a sub-note, I thought uh, everybody woke up one day and the Depression was here and the banks were closed. Apparently, from hearing this over the years, they knew that things were getting bad and, and, and things weren't looking good. And I think that's why they decided not to build the seven-story hotel on top. The 20s were, were approaching, and this was about uh, 24, 25 when they started construction of this building. And at that time, they originally were going to do the hotel, and as construction went on, they decided not to do it. And uh, they stopped with a one-story building. Which is what, what we see which today. Is what we're in right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, Harry, I noticed you have this sign painted onto a mirror. Tell me about that. <laughs> That's an oversized logo. I'll tell you what, we've had a lot of movies in here. We've been, we've okay. been so fortunate, a, a dozen, 20 plus. You I know, didn't know that. Big yeah. movies, big movies. And um, three or four years ago, uh, Alondro Inaratu, an award-winning producer and director from Mexico, was doing his first U.S. film. And it was called 21 Grams. That was a big one. That was a big movie. It had uh, Naomi Benicio, Watts in it, Benicio Del Toro, Del Toro Royce, and yes. Sean Penn. And uh, anyway, this was, uh, they, they used the front booth up there that's closest to the cash register. And that was part of the scene that they were filming. And we were actually in the movie about four times in different spots. Oh. But they were getting a reflection off this mirror behind us. And most of the time when these guys are filming, they come in with big screens, gray, white, black, and so forth, and they change the environment and the light and so forth. Uh, I took my eye off the uh, production that morning for five minutes, and they had this thing chalked out. Anyway, we like it a lot. We had them come fix it where we could keep it for us. I think the, uh, the logo here uh, is, is interesting, by the way, now that you mention the movies. Uh, and 21 Grams was just one of the shows that, that has been done well, in here over the years. We've had... Uh, what, what are some of the other ones? Well, uh, um, uh, The Firm the was fire. filmed okay. in here, The Client, uh, Great Balls of Fire. Uh, the Jerry Lee Lewis flick, yeah. Uh -huh. Mystery Train, uh, Memphis with uh, Sybil Shepherd Shepard. was in that. We've had, uh, uh, of late, we've had uh, uh, Walk the Line. The Johnny Cash Johnny flick. Johnny Cash yeah. movie, Elizabeth Town, Cameron Crowe's hit. 
Uh, the most recent was My Blueberry Nights. It was filmed about a year ago, and they're just finished with a cutting room floor, and I think it's getting ready to uh, to be out by Christmas of this year. So we'll see your restaurant in mm -hmm. that film. Great. Yeah, we've been, been very lucky with all that. Yeah. Now, didn't you tell me, or did I understand this right, that there was once an Elvis TV show filmed here? Why would they do that? Uh, you know, they came out, I don't remember the years, maybe late 80s, early 90s. It was called Elvis the Early Years. Okay. And uh, they filmed, filmed several scenes of that in here. In fact, for that one, I remember them using the uh, small two-man booth adjacent to the booth that 21 Grams was used for. Yeah. Uh, it was a good show. Was it? Yeah. 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 Is there a reason why they would film an Elvis <laughs> flick in this? You know, Memphis is Graceland, yeah. and Memphis is Elvis. Yeah. Uh, we've just had our 30th uh, anniversary for Elvis Presley. Elvis used to eat in here. He ate in here before he was a big boy, and he ate in here when he was a big boy. And he would sit right there facing this mirror. And the logo, of course, wasn't up there. Yeah, before the paint. On there. Yeah. And he could see who was coming up behind him from the front door where the front of the restaurant is and they'd run outside when they had to. So I wish I'd been around. I, I, if I was here, I was one year old, don't remember anything, but wish I'd been around to see all the girls running down the aisle and him running out the back. There's another case of Elvis mania. Yeah, yeah. Good stories though. Yeah. True. True stories. Mm -hmm. Well, Harry, from what I understand, Elvis liked to do things at night because, you know, after he became famous, there were fewer people around at night. He could run around and do things and maybe not get bothered so much. But, would that be a reason why it came in here in your restaurant? I, I think so. Uh, the, the restaurant was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week since its inception up until 1992, as a matter of fact. Uh, the Malco Theater, right up the street a block or two, which is now the Orpheum, uh, had, had a lot to do with probably him being down here. I think they would rent the movie house out and they'd come in here at night, yeah. In fact, the arcade was open 24-7 all of its days until the uh, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King uh. on the block right behind us. And my father and I were planting a tree at my house. I was a kid, 12, 13 years old, right. and worked here, growing up, worked here, and he wouldn't let me come back, but they called and asked him to come down here. There's, there's a problem, and the police have come in and asked everybody to close down and go home. And I finished planting the tree. He wouldn't let me come down, and he came down, and this place had never been closed before. They didn't have locks on the doors. Oh, jeez. They had oh, to Lord. figure out how to turn all this equipment off back here. Never been turned off before. Oh, my. If something's open 24 hours, it's open. They had to uh, get locks, uh, locksmith to come in. And I remember him coming home at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't know that I remember this, but I remember the story. And he was home about four or five hours. And they called up and asked him to come back down and open up. Huh. Why? Somebody's got to feed all these people. All, oh, the National Guard, the National was, here. Guard was here. Taken care of, but I think the police and all these guys needed to eat. So I think the thing was closed for four hours at the most. My goodness, yeah. yeah. Harry, thank you. Appreciate you letting us stay here. We're going to leave you now and go uh, down to South Memphis and visit Elvis's church. Then let's carry on. Come on. We're standing in front of what used to be Elvis's church, the Assembly of God Church. The Assembly of God congregation has moved. But back in the 1950s, Elvis would come to this church for Sunday services, Wednesday gospel Bible studies, and gospel music practice. Now, Elvis could have gone to church closer to his home in the north side of town, but he didn't. He came to this church in the south side of town. Why? Because he wanted to be near the Blackwood Brothers Gospel Quartet. This was their church where they worshiped and also held gospel singing practice. Elvis wanted to be a gospel singer, that was well known. There's a story that he actually tried out to be a gospel singer here in these buildings. The Blackwood Brothers had a teen gospel group called the Songfellows, and it was meant to train young men to uh, become professional gospel singers to sing in a quartet. 
Elvis tried out to be a song fellow and he was turned down. Now later in life, Elvis used to tease the Blackwood brothers and says, yeah, you told me I couldn't sing, showed you, huh, huh. And, but that's really not what the Blackwood brothers said. And they said that Elvis couldn't sing in a quartet. And if you know anything about singing at all, singing in a quartet is very different from singing lead. Elvis couldn't blend his voice in with the other three members of the group. Therefore, he needed to be a lead singer. This is also where Elvis met one of his first uh, girlfriends, uh, serious girlfriends, and her name was Dixie Locke. She was a member of this church. In 1954, Elvis and Dixie dated just like any teenage couple. They went to the roller skating rink, went to the movies, and they also attended all the gospel productions that took place in this city. Uh, both Elvis and Dixie were very interested in gospel music. And uh, I think I'm sure Elvis expressed his desire to be a gospel singer to her. Now, Elvis's career took a different turn, as we know. He became a artist with Sun Records and what we consider to be a rock and roll star. And that turn in direction did not make Dixie happy. She did not envision herself as the wife of a rock and roll singer. And by 1955, she and Elvis split up and she went on to marry someone else. So we're going to leave Macklemore Street here in South Memphis, but really stay in the same neighborhood. We're going to go to the East Trigg Baptist Church, where Elvis listened to gospel music again, except this time the singers were black. So we are on East Trigg Street, and that happened to be the name of this church for many years to my left, East Trigg Baptist Church. And Elvis used to attend services here, which was unusual because this was a black congregation, and white folks didn't usually attend black churches. But Elvis did, and some other white folks did as well. The minister here was Reverend Herbert Brewster, and he happened to be a gospel music songwriter and he also created these gospel music, I would say shows, they're religious services, but they're also um, places where gospel singers performed, and it was really like a show. He, he attracted the best singers in the nation, and that, of course, attracted people interested in gospel music. Elvis and some of his friends, people like Dewey Phillips, the Blackwood Brothers, all these white folks would go to Brewster's church to hear the singers. They wouldn't participate in the singing, they would sit in the back and observe. Now Reverend Brewster years later used to talk about Elvis. He remembered this teenage boy who was so interested in the music. And that is something that uh, I think a lot of people overlook, the influence of gospel music, black gospel music, on Elvis's career. He loved this music and he incorporated a lot of the styles, the vocal styles, stage movements from these black singers into his own performance. We're going to leave the churches and gospel singing and go on to a rather sadder uh, religious experience, death itself. We're gonna to go to the burial spot, the first burial spot of Elvis and his mother, Gladys, Forest Hill Cemetery. It's just down the road here in South Memphis. So come on, let's go. Inside this mausoleum here at Forest Hill Cemetery is where Elvis Presley was originally buried three days after he died. On that day, the ground that I'm standing on was covered with flowers. Every floor shop within 100 miles of Memphis was completely out of flowers. There were, of course, thousands of people here in Memphis that day to witness the burial of Elvis Presley. Elvis was buried in what was meant to be a family crypt. If you look behind me, you'll notice a window with a plastic flower that was supposed to be the crypt. 
He was laid to rest there for all of two months. And then the unexpected happened. There was an attempted break-in, an attempt to steal the body of Elvis Presley. And that, of course, alarmed the city officials, of course, the Presley family. And the city allowed the Presley family to bury Elvis again at Graceland, what is now Meditation Gardens. Now some might ask, why would Elvis be buried here in this uh, cemetery where the security really isn't uh, perfect? And the answer is that his mother, Gladys, died here in 1958, and she was buried here. And of course that death affected Elvis a great deal. I think it affected his mental health, and you know, a lot of people that knew Elvis will tell you the same thing. He never really recovered from her death. But she was buried here in the cemetery, just beyond the way there. And at the same time, Elvis's body was moved to Graceland. Her body was moved to Graceland as well. And today, of course, you can see the burial place of Elvis, Gladys, Vernon, the father, and Minnie Mae, the grandmother of Elvis. We're going to leave this place of sadness and go on to Midtown and find some places that brought happiness to Elvis Presley. The Mid-South Fairgrounds, Liberty Land Amusement Park, Mid-South Coliseum. So come on in and join me. We're here at the old Fairgrounds Liberty Land Amusement Park and behind me is probably one of the oldest roller coasters in America. We call it the Zippin' Pippin' and I believe it dates back to 1925. There's been an amusement park here that long and it was a favorite ride for a lot of people in Memphis. Of course, it's the most famous rider, shall we say, is Elvis Presley. Now, after Elvis became famous, he would rent the entire amusement park for his parties in the summertime. And you would probably have a hundred people out here enjoying the amusement park, the roller coaster, and uh, on Elvis's dime. And he would pay the employees of the park to operate the rides and sell the candy and the popcorn and all that. Now, riding a roller coaster, Elvis was quite an adventure. I had one friend tell me that Elvis rode the roller coaster 10 times without stopping. So after the 10th time, you can imagine the other passengers were a little bit woozy. And he was quite a, he was quite a daredevil on the roller coaster. He and his friends, they would often uh, egg each other on, you know, like here's 50 bucks, go stand up on the next ride. Or go stand on the side of the car on the next ride. And then the ultimate stunt, which I'm surprised no one got killed doing, was it would actually jump off the car in the middle of the ride. There's a, a point in a roller coaster where it slows down as it crests the hill, and you had a 30 second window of opportunity to jump out on the ledge. Of course, if you mistime your jump, bad things would have happened. So we're really fortunate no one got hurt doing this. But of course, they didn't think of those things when they were doing it, they were just crazy. Now away from the roller coaster here, on my other side, is the Mid-South Coliseum. And this is where Elvis performed in the years 1974, 1975, and 1976. His last performance in Memphis was July 5th, 1976. Now some of you may have a concert album that uh, was created in 1974, and that was filmed here and recorded here in the Mid-South Coliseum, uh, the March 1974 performances. Today the Mid-South Coliseum is almost vacant. I think occasionally a group will use the the old building for an event or two and that's kind of sad. That's you know it's a big arena, 12,000 seats, but it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of today's uh, sports stadiums and arenas so it's going to sit vacant and perhaps it'll be demolished. It, that would be a sad thing. We're going to leave Liberty Land in the fairgrounds but continuing with the theme of Elvis's entertainment, we're going to a short drive in the Midtown area to Elvis' favorite movie theater, the Manfian. He rented this out many a time, and we're going to go inside and have a look. We're at 
the Playhouse on the Square, which used to be known as the Memphian Theater, one of Elvis's favorite places to go and watch movies. Frank Garino is going to tell us some stories about Elvis and his time here, so let's go inside and meet Frank. We're now inside the Playhouse on the Square. We're going to talk to Frank. He's going to tell us a story, a couple Morning, stories about Elvis. Good to see you again. Tell me about how Elvis met one of his famous girlfriends. Okay, well, this is a, a story that was relayed to us by George Klein. Uh, Linda Thompson had been on George's radio show, and George thought it would be great if she met Elvis. So George said to Linda, listen, uh, Elvis is going to have a bunch of us over to Memphian Theater tonight to watch films. Would you like to meet him? And Linda was a little bit hesitant because she knew Elvis was going through a divorce. However, uh, she did agree to come over here to the Memphian Theater and meet Elvis. And as according to George, what happened is Elvis was in the men's room over here, and nobody went in the men's room with Elvis. That was the rule. <laughs> And uh, George went in there to let Elvis know that he had somebody out here he wanted uh, Elvis to meet. And this was the concession area. So right in this immediate area uh, was where Linda was. And Linda didn't plan on staying. She had brought one of her girlfriends, Miss Rhode Island, that year. And they had parked their car right out front illegally because as far as Linda was concerned, she was just going to meet Elvis. And so right in this immediate area, George went in, got Elvis, brought Elvis out, and introduced Elvis to Linda Thompson right here, and the rest, they say, is history. This is where their relationship started. So it, it's, it's one of those things. It's a good story. We should also say that Linda at the time was Miss Tennessee. Exactly. And Elvis uh, had a, after Priscilla, he had a, a kind of a habit of dating beauty queens, and she was, of course, one of those. That's exactly right. right. Well, Frank, you have people come into this theater on an Elvis tour what do they want to see? Well, the urinals are one of the things they definitely want to see. And the original uh, uh, urinals are still in there. So people will just go in there and see. And then, of course, they want to see anything else that was originally part of the Memphian Theater. And down around the corner, we have the original neon and also original sign that was over here pointing the walkway to the Memphian. So let's very, very easily walk down here and we'll also see one of the chairs that was in the original 12th row that Elvis sat in. Let's go sit in the chair. Okay, let's go in the chair. Well, here's the chair. That's right. That's that's one of the chairs that came out of the 12th row of the theater. You always, you always sat in the 12th row? Always in the 12th row. Not necessarily in a specific seat. However, uh, generally in the center section, because there were side sections, but when we took the old chairs out that were originally there from 1939 and replaced them, we preserved that entire 12 row. Uh, oh, 12 that's row. Great. So, and this was one of the chairs that was certified as Elvis having sat in, so, you know, so we keep that for prosperity. I want to sit in there, but this picture is interesting. Tell me about this. Yeah, this, this is a picture of the original Memphian Theater. Uh, here's the box office outside, uh, which has been removed, and uh, we were fortunate enough uh, that the Memphian name was still on the theater when we purchased it, so we preserved this neon here that was vertical, and now we have it in our Memphian room, which we created in honor of, Me of the Memphian Theater, uh, which is really adjoins the original theater. It used to be a paint shop, and so we'll, we'll move around the let's, corner. Yeah, let's take a look we'll, at that. We'll let's see that neon. This is not something I uh, knew that they could do, Mike, but they can actually take neon and change it from a vertical to a horizontal. So oh. there it is. That's the original neon. Oh, yeah. And uh, we did change, uh, change it. To you know, I can remember when the Memphian was a theater. I used to watch movies here, uh, I guess, back in the 80s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can remember the neon. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, and, and this was a, a, one of the flagship theaters of the Malco chain. So yes. it, was, it was very popular. It was. Well, Mike, uh, as you well know, this theater was built in 1939 as a movie house. Right. And it was one of the original Malco theaters. It showed nothing but top-of-the-line movies. And uh, as the Malco family uh, realized as time went on that it was very expensive to run, this area here, uh, which is Overton Square, was going downhill. It seems and, hard to believe now. Oh it's yeah, gone back up. It's, yeah, it definitely has. But in the in the late 70s, early 80s, it was going downhill, and so they decided to get rid of the Malco Theater uh, here, the Memphian Theater, and uh, the Memphian Theater was sold 
to a gentleman who was very notorious at the time and is still notorious and in jail today by the name of Danny Owens. Uh, Danny purchased the Memphian Theater and Danny's claim to fame was he ran adult bookstores and also triple X theaters. And unfortunately... Pornography, though. Yes, for those. that's right. Uh, that's right, pornography. Pornography. For those yeah. who are not familiar with triple X rating. And unfortunately, <laughs> this was one of the theaters that he converted to triple X. And I never went there at that time. I just want to break in and okay, tell you that. Okay, okay. It's, it's very disheartening to the Lightman family that it turned into that oh, because yeah. he maintained the Memphian name. Oh, uh, and, and so oh. it was really, really disheartening to them. I sure and, was. And uh, what happened is uh, Danny uh, got indicted, and uh, he had a very good attorney, but the attorney was very smart. He knew Danny uh, was not very good for his finances and demanded that he have cash on the barrel head to represent Danny. And so what happened is Danny had to auction off some of his assets, and this, the Memphian Theater, was one of the assets that Danny auctioned off and Playhouse on the Square was over here on the corner that's where we got our name Playhouse on, on the, the square. square we were on the square and we heard about it we went to the auction and in 1984 we bought this grand old theater that was built in 1939 so, so the theater so. came to kind of a happy conclusion absolutely here. So and the, one of the Lightman uh, family members is on our board today and it made them very happy that the Memphian uh, maintained its name now that brings up why the theater name is over here as opposed to there. We had to preserve our name, Playhouse on the Square. So we took down the Memphian sign and we said, hey, we have to put up Playhouse on the Square. But when we bought this building right next to the Memphian Theater, which was a paint shop, we created this room, which is a little room for people to sit and uh, Enjoy themselves at intermission, and we named it the Memphian Room so in honor of the theater. So you've also preserved history as well. As oh, absolutely. absolutely. Delivered live theater for the Memphis community. And that's what we are. We're live theater, and we say only love beats live theater. <laughs> so. okay, okay, Mike, why don't we go into the theater and we'll talk about some things that so went on in there. Can I sit in the chair? Um, why don't we sit in the chair later? Okay, all right, let's go into theater. Mike, before we go into the main theater, let me tell you a story about the, this alleyway here. Okay. This is, this is where the building actually ended, and this really was the alleyway. Oh. And one of the reasons that Elvis would come in the side door here is because the popcorn machine couldn't fit in the concession stand. Really? Absolutely. So the popcorn machine would be outside, and uh, that brought lots of business because people could smell it. But Elvis would come in this alleyway, he would stop and get his popcorn and go directly to row 12, which is where he sat. So, oh, okay, so great. That's, that's what's famous about this alleyway, the popcorn machine. Popcorn machine, I can't believe that. <laughs> Let's go into the theater. All right. All right, here we are inside the theater, once the Memphian Theater, now Playhouse on the Square. Right. Yeah, it's funny, Elvis. one of the things that, that happened this, uh, this year with the Elvis tours is uh, people immediately rushed in here and said, Where, where's Elvis's row, where's Elvis's row? Well, these are not the original seats. We no. took the original seats out in 1998 and uh, preserved a, a lot of them. Unfortunately, uh, we preserved them under the stage. And uh, little did we know that we had a drainage problem, uh -oh. and uh, we had a big, uh, big thunderstorm, big rain, and lo and behold, uh, water came in because we had adjusted the walkway out there. Water came in and ruined a bunch of the chairs. Ooh. Yeah, so so we lost those chairs. We moved them since over to our warehouse. But we had already preserved the 12th row because we had moved it back here when we had added a stage. In 1984, when we built this theater, uh, we had to create the stage. So we took out about 12 rows of seats uh, and uh, operated from 1984 to 1998 with the original seats. The original seats had 
uh, cast iron on the sides, uh, and uh, we're, we're not as comfortable as our patrons would have liked, but they also wore out. So from 1939 uh, to 1998, that's a pretty that's good That's a long life. time for yeah, good, yeah, real, real long time. But uh, the, the other thing that, that people want to know is where was the 12th row? The 12th row was approximately where the edge of our stage is. Oh, and, I, yeah, it has, the configuration has changed. That's right. Yes. The configuration had to change. We had to build the stage. Yeah. And the back wall that you see there is really a false back wall. The other entrance that El Elvis used to use is back on the left-hand side and what we today call our stage door. So it's where our actors come in. Uh, they come in through our stage doors, one of the doors where Elvis would come. Okay. And that's where the sign about the walkway was. The walkway to the Memphian was on that side of the building. Okay, so, yeah. Um, it, it, it's one of those things that as you transition uh, from a movie house to live theater, you have to make yeah, allowances. Yeah, you have to change. Yeah. Frank, I understand there was a bit of protocol to, to these little uh, movie parties. Yeah. You know, Elvis always sat in the 12th row. That's well, exactly right. Well, who sat in front of him? Well, nobody sat in front of Elvis, <laughs> and that was one of the rules. It's cardinal rule. Uh, cardinal huh? rule. Uh, <laughs> for a couple of reasons. It wasn't about being famous, but rather Elvis didn't like to be distracted, but he also didn't like people turning around and looking at him. So ah. Elvis said nobody sits in front of him and rarely did somebody get to sit in the row with Elvis uh, one of the exceptions that we know because George told us is the night that Linda Thompson stayed she sat in Elvis's row I would think the girlfriend would sit next to him yeah well yeah, you know she wasn't the girlfriend yet she, uh, she, there was she the was, first date we could he, say right let's just say he wanted her to be the girlfriend that's right <laughs> yeah and I think he was successful yes the other thing that we know and unfortunately nobody knows what happened to the propped, if you want to call it that, is the theater would always put out like a table tray for Elvis. And they, they would put it in the 12th row. And again, he didn't always sit in the same seat. Right. Uh, but they would set that up and they would put one or two glasses of ice water for Elvis. He, he, he didn't do it, but he did uh, also have an ashtray, one of those old ashtrays that sits on the floor. Oh, in yeah, glass yeah. shape. Yes. yes. Well, they don't know what happened to that either. Uh. But Elvis didn't smoke cigarettes but he smoked cigars oh, yeah. when he was watching the movie. And uh, the other thing that, that would happen is, is Elvis would come in with uh, the people that were invited. He would invite his inner circle, and they each got to invite a couple of guests. Various people say uh, the number varies, but some people have even said that if you were uh, in the inner circle, you invited me as a guest, I was allowed to invite a guest. So there were sometimes 50 to 100 people here. This theater sat over 700 people at the time. Yeah. The configurations change so much, we only seat 258 today. So you can see that we oh, eliminated. Oh yeah, you, you sure the, have. Yeah, yeah. The, the rows were also a little bit more concave than they were, so they could get more chairs in. Um, but, but speaking about the movies, many times they would watch uh, uh, movies over and over, and one in particular was his favorite movie, which was? Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove, ah, yes. exactly. I've seen it. And, and George Klein shared a story with us. George would always sit back here on the left-hand side of the theater, and uh, uh, they came, and George knew that they were going to watch Dr. Strangelove that night. And uh, George also shared that a lot of times if they knew that Elvis had picked up uh, Dr. Strangelove or had it picked up by his people, uh, they try and get out of it because they had seen Dr. Strangelove a few times. But George was here, and uh, lo and behold, they got done watching it the first time, and Elvis says, okay, projectionist, let's run that again. So George went, oh my gosh, here oh, we go. Oh, here we go. Right. Oh, yes. So lo and behold, they got done the second time, and guess what? Elvis says, let's run that again. George says, that he stood up and he said, Elvis, I'm leaving for the night, and <laughs> left. He said he wasn't going to watch it a third time. So, so that, that's uh, one of the things that would happen. Elvis had particular movies. Uh, the other movies he particularly liked are uh, the P Peter Sellers movies. Peter Sellers, he okay. loved comedy. I know one right. of his favorites was Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail. Yeah. He loved that film. Yeah. And, and he also absurd economy. Yeah. He watched all of, all of Peter Sellers' Pink Panther stuff. Oh, you goodness. Know, and, and he just loved those. And uh, the speculation is he, he really enjoyed Peter Sellers because of all the versatile roles that Peter Sellers played. And again, it's that absurd comedy. He liked that. Yeah. 
Now, one of the serious movies I heard he liked was uh, Patton, George yeah. C. Scott. He watched Patton here. We know that for a fact. Yeah. That was yeah. one of the movies that's, that's uh, between uh, George Klein and uh, uh, Jerry, Jerry Schilling. Schilling. Yeah. Uh, both of those gentlemen have documented for us movies that were watched here in, Memphi in the Memphian. One of the questions we get a lot of, uh, uh, Mike, are... Uh, why did Elvis come to the Memphian? Yeah, there were several theaters in town, and exactly. he did go to other theaters from time to time. And so, yeah, why this one? He, he went to other theaters, but this was one of his favorites for two reasons that we know. Number one, Overton Square was a booming area. Number two, Elvis's karate instructor was over on Poplar, where the high tone is yeah. today. Near Overton Park. That's exactly. Right. Very and, close. And very close. And so Elvis was very comfortable in this area. He was also comfortable but about the management staff here. Uh, the management staff would allow Elvis to come in at 11, 12, 1 o'clock. Many times they would call ahead and they would say, Elvis is coming. Uh, Elvis rarely entered the front doors. He would come in the side doors. So what they would do is they would prop open the side doors because they wouldn't know which one he was coming in. <laughs> but don't forget the popcorn story. He a yeah. lot of times came down that alley yeah. because of the popcorn. Uh, the other thing uh, that, that we know is Elvis really uh, liked to treat people well. Uh, he took care of paying everybody on the staff. Oh, okay. yeah, I've heard that. They doubled their salary. Yep. And, yeah, and, 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 and he did not have to rent the facility. That's one of the questions we get asked. The, the Malco Theaters donated the facility for him, but he paid for the films. He went out and got the films from the uh, movie exchange, which is in town. Yeah. Uh, his people would go pick them up. And uh, the other thing that uh, Elvis did, uh, uh, again, one of these cute stories, is uh, Elvis gave out bonuses to everybody in the theater and one year he had his bodyguard uh, go around and uh, give uh, bonuses to the people in an envelope. And lo and behold, when the people opened him, they were just simply a McDonald gift certificate. And, and, and the people went, my gosh, as rich as this man is. And what happened is Elvis was playing a prank. Elvis then walked around, which he had always done every year, and gave each individual a envelope that had a hundred dollar bill in it so Elvis was generous as we all know and that's one of the examples so he also had a weird sense of humor yeah well Frank thanks for all your stories I appreciate it we've learned a lot uh, we're gonna leave you now what we're gonna do is take your suggestion and go around the corner and see Congaree's old karate studio on Poplar Avenue great movie great movie <laughs> We're on Poplar Avenue in Midtown Memphis. As you can tell, it's one of the busiest parts of Memphis. We're here in front of Congaree's first karate studio. Congaree was and still is a karate instructor. And Elvis, as you may have read, has loved martial arts of all kinds. He trained with Congaree for many years in the late 60s and early 70s. In most of the photographs we have of Elvis practicing karate were actually taken inside this building. Elvis not only liked to practice karate, but he actually put it into his live performances in the 70s. Maybe you've seen uh, footage of Elvis in Vegas where he moved out on stage. He was incorporating those karate moves into his stage performance. It's even been said that he took the jumpsuit concept from the karate gi, which was a two-piece pants and top, very, very loose fitting clothing that he could move around in and that's what he wanted his jumpsuits on stage to be, very loose fitting. So we can see that karate was a major influence on Elvis's life and Elvis valued Congaree as a friend. Congaree still teaches karate today, only his studio or dojo as they call it is now out in the suburbs of Memphis. Our next stop is really just across the road here at Overton Park. Overton Park is very famous in Memphis history. It's the site of the zoo, art college, also the, the major art museum. But we're not going to see any of that. We're going to see the location where Elvis wiggled and girls screamed for the first time. So we're on our way.
Here we are in Overton Park and behind me is the shell. Its formal name is the Raoul Wallenberg shell, named after the diplomat who saved many lives during the Holocaust. But we still call it its original name, the Overton Park shell. It was created around 1936. It was the site of many performances down through the years. But in Elvis lore, it's known for one performance. And that took place on July 30th, 1954 just after Elvis recorded his first songs for Sun Records. And Elvis was placed on a country and western package show. I don't know if you know what that means, but they usually gathered several artists, and each artist would sing two or three songs, and then the lead singer, the one whose name was prominent in the ad, he would close the show and sing about five or six songs. And on that package show, the lead singer was Slim Whitman, country artist, a Grand Ole Opry star. And Elvis was placed at the bottom of the bill, his least known act, and he was first on and first off. And during that performance uh, with Scotty Moore and Bill Black, somehow or another Elvis moved around a bit. He walked backstage after singing his two songs and he asked, why are they screaming, what's going on? And the answer was, it's you man, go out there and do it again. And thus the legend was born. This is where Elvis wiggled for the first time and the girl screamed. You know, it's funny, we, we tend to think of screaming girls as being teenagers. Turns out it wasn't quite so, it wasn't always so. Uh, later on we'll talk about Sun Records and Sam Phillips and Sam's uh, business manager and friend was a woman named Marion Keisker and she talked about uh, being here that first night Elvis performed. She was uh, front row and she's not a teenager. And during Elvis's performance, she heard a lot of screaming, and then she realized she was one of the screamers. So whatever it was Elvis had, he had it from the very beginning, from that very first show. You know, it would be great if someone had a picture of Elvis on stage that first evening performing with Scotty Moore and Bill Black. But we haven't seen it yet. So far, we haven't. From what I understand, there are hundreds of people here that were witnesses to Elvis's show but no one took pictures, apparently. I wish they did. We do have one great picture of Elvis. He was actually backstage. He's holding his guitar. He's just kind of standing there, kind of free and easy. And in those days, you could walk up to Elvis and ask to take a picture, and he didn't mind at all. But that was taken in the next summer, 1955. By that time, by that show, Elvis was the star of the show. Last act on, not the bottom. And you know who was the opening act for that show? Johnny Cash. People that don't know Elvis well, they tend to think of the big showrooms, the superstardom, the arenas. But at the beginning of Elvis's career, he was playing kind of ordinary places like this band shell. And the next place is even more down to earth. It's a shopping center just south of here. So we're going to take a short trip. Come on, follow me. One location to Shell, to our next stop, the Lamar Airway Shopping Center. These little gigs were a start. It's part of the irony of Elvis Presley, that two years later, 1956, Elvis will be playing in front of a national television audience of, what, 80 million Americans, 100 million Americans. But he had to start somewhere. And uh, these, these two places were part of that beginning. You know, he was... Early on, he was helped by a local promoter, country music uh, disc jockey named Bob Neal. And Bob had a, he had a disc jockey job here in Memphis, and he took a notice of Elvis. He was one also that broke Elvis into the south uh, by placing him on the Louisiana Hayride, which is in Shreveport, Louisiana. That led to gigs in Texas and so on. Bob didn't like to travel though, because he had kids at home and he had this job here in Memphis. And it was kind of tough to take a country artist on the road two or three weeks at a time and be away from home. So he contacted a uh, fellow promoter from Nashville who was working with Hank Snow at the time. Hank was a big country western artist. And he asked this guy, you know, put, put my artist on your show bill and take them all through Texas for me. And that promoter was Colonel Thomas Parker. So that's how Elvis met the Colonel. And a few months after that meeting, six months, eight months, 
there was no more Bob Neal in the picture. Elvis made his uh, handshake agreement with Parker, and Parker became the next manager of Elvis Presley. We're here at the Lamar Airways Shopping Center, and that's busy Lamar Avenue to my right. Lamar Avenue actually feature in our story later it happens to be Highway 78. So let's get back to Elvis and the start of his career. In September 1954, this shopping center opens. And Elvis, Scotty, and Bill were one of the performers hired to perform at the grand opening ceremonies. There was a temporary stage put in front of the Cat's Drug Store, and the artist got up there and did what, two songs? We're not sure how many. It was a very simple affair. They were paid a grand total of $100, and then that was it. Then the next artist got on, and um, that was it. That was just a short performance. I have a great photograph of Elvis leaning against a car here in the shopping center. He's wearing uh, probably one of those Lansky outfits, and he's got just a bit of a mustache on his 19-year-old face. You know, a lot of people tell me that they're here that fateful day when Elvis performed at the Lamar Airways Shopping Center. They may have been. I don't know how many were here, 200, 300. No one really knows. It's a far cry, though, from a couple of years later when Elvis was performing on national television in front of 80 million Americans and in the big arenas with 10,000, 20,000 screaming teenagers. A far cry from those days. We're on our way now to the last house the Presley's lived in before they became rich. It's just a couple of miles from here, a short trip away, so come on, follow me. We are on busy Getwell Road here in East Memphis, and we're at an approximate location of the last house that the Presley's rented before they became rich. The address is 1414 Getwell. And the Presley family lived here during part of 1955 and then on to March 1956. So this is a transition from local struggling artists to national and international fame. The fateful day was actually November 29, 1955. That's the day that the contract was signed that moved Elvis from Sun Records here in Memphis to the big corporation, RCA. And so Elvis had to have a co-signer. He was 20 years old. He was not legal age to sign contracts on his own. So his mother and father signed a contract with him. And uh, clearly on the contract is the address 1414 Getwell. The house at 1414 Getwell is gone, but it's typical of the homes as you see scattered around me. A wood frame, two or three bedrooms, very small house. Was, I guess you would call it a working class neighborhood. It was a rental place, and uh, the people who live here today are not wealthy either. Now from 1414 Getwell, we're going to move to the next Presley address, and that's the more famous one, the 1034 Audubon Drive. And as we make this move, it's not far away, it's a short trip, but we're going to make that move from poverty and working class to wealth, because you'll see the difference when we get to Audubon Drive. You know, Memphis is kind of funny. You, you can go from these run-down, rather poor neighborhoods where you, know, you see trash strewn around, and then turn a corner a couple blocks away, and then you're into very, very well-to-do neighborhoods. Uh, I see that not just in this part of East Memphis, but in Midtown and you know some of the other parts of the city. So we're on a quiet street here in East Memphis. This is Audubon Drive. And behind me is the first home that Elvis Presley ever bought, 1034 Audubon Drive. Any of you who've ever read the first fan magazines or the biographies of Elvis have heard of this home. This is where he lived in the year 1956 when he became famous around the world. So imagine the delight of the Presley family. They moved from these poor rental houses, these poor neighborhoods, to this very quiet, upper class, uh, what was then a suburb of Memphis. And they have a house that's four bedrooms, two and a half baths, 
have a space in the backyard big enough to put in a swimming pool. Happened to be the largest pool in Memphis at the time they installed it. I mean, this house was kind of the, the, the uh, accumulation of the dream. That early in Elvis's life, he had bought the home that his parents had always dreamed of owning. So this house was kind of the, the accumulation of a dream. Wealth, fame, adulation. Unfortunately, that does have a prize, and that prize, uh, one of those prizes is a loss of privacy. People would come up to the door, knock on the door, peek in the windows, knock on the windows, and the Presley's had to install that gate and fence to at least ensure some privacy. Of course, that wasn't enough. You could easily climb the fence and still knock on the windows and say hey to Elvis. Truthfully though, Elvis and, the, and his family, they kind of liked the attention. It was all new to them. If you knocked on the door in those days, if you follow that driveway to the kitchen door, knocked on it and Gladys answered, oh, you like my son? She would say, well, here's a cookie, here's a glass of lemonade. Or she might often say, well, he's inside resting, but if you wait a few minutes, he'll come out and talk to you. And he would. It was very, very approachable, very accessible to his fans. I mean, let's face it, this is 1956, he's 21. This is all new to him, he was excited. At the end of the year, after the Ed Sullivan shows, he started to have bigger crowds. Neighbors complained, police were called to direct traffic. If you can imagine that, this street filled with cars. And that was a bit more of a disruption for the Presley family. In one episode in September 1956, it was after at least one of the Ed Sullivan show appearances, and they were filming Love Me Tender. And during a break in the filming, Elvis and Nick Adams, a character actor he met in Hollywood, were here at Audubon Drive. And they're standing on the inside of the fence looking out. And on the opposite side were fans lined three, five deep, arms outstretched, all holding a piece of paper for Elvis to autograph. It, to my mind, it, it appears like a president, presidential candidate reaching out to his, to his voters. So in the fall of 56, the crowds grew noise and confusion grew, the neighbors grew less and less patient, and finally they asked the Presleys to move, which of course offended the Presleys. But really all parties agreed that this situation couldn't last, that the Presley family needed more privacy and security, bigger space, and more land. And that led to the purchase of Graceland in March of 1957. So Elvis moved here when he was 21, moved out when he was 22, and then the following year, he was drafted into the United States Army. Our next location is the old Army Hospital. This is where Elvis received his physical his booster shots and boarded a bus to go to basic training. That's just around the corner from here, so let's go see it right now. back on Getwell Road just around the corner from Audubon Drive and you're probably asking yourselves why is this called Getwell Road? Well behind me was the Army Hospital created after World War II it was called Kennedy Hospital and they wanted a name that would help the soldiers recover from their wounds hence Getwell Road. The most famous United States Army personnel to come into this hospital was none other than Elvis Presley. He was drafted, of course, in the year 1957. But he and the Colonel Parker asked for a deferment to make the movie King Creole, so he was not taken into the Army until the year 1958. In fact, it was March 1958 that Elvis and the other recruits were brought from downtown Memphis to this hospital for their army physicals, for their haircuts, and all the other things they needed to do to become army privates. Colonel Parker never missed a beat in promotion. He sold the rights to Life Magazine, the rights to photograph Elvis getting his haircut, getting his booster shots for the physician. Elvis was also covered by all the news media at the time, the film crews, uh, this was page one story across America uh, in 1958. And the last shot we have of Elvis on this property, he's boarding the bus to go to Texas uh, to start his basic training. 
and one can see Elvis boarding the bus and his mother's beside him with tears in her eye. This is a big moment in their lives and uh, after Elvis entered the Army, things will never be the same. We're going to leave this busy corner of East Memphis and we're going to South Memphis to Coletta's Pizza. Well, Elvis liked this place more than the Army Hospital. We're going to meet Jerry Coletta and he's going to tell us what Elvis liked here. We're here inside Coletta's restaurant We're with Mr. Jerry Coletta, who, if I understand right, Jerry, thanks for talking to us. Your yeah. grandfather started this business many years ago. He did. He did? Back in 1922. This Italian immigrant came over from Italy and uh, he knew the food business, though, and especially ice cream. And uh, he started up a business called the Suburban Ice Cream Company, in which he had uh, mostly ice cream products. Uh, but he also had sandwiches and spaghetti, ravioli, a few, few Italian items on the, on the menu also. Now, your restaurant's more known for pizzas today. When did that come about? When did you start pizzas? Well, that's right. Uh, but back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, pizza was not really uh, even a food type in America. Uh, if pizza didn't really get started to the 50s, and even then it was mostly in New York and Chicago. And uh, my dad started uh, pizza in the uh, mid-50s. And uh, in fact, he went up to Chicago to see how they were made and all. And, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, we were the first ones in Memphis to have pizza. Okay. But uh, it wasn't going over too well. People didn't know what it was, so he came up with the idea of a barbecue pizza. Ah. Uh, Everybody knew what barbecue was. Everyone in Memphis knows barbecue. That's right. So uh, we introduced the barbecue pizza, and it kind of made pizza sales take off. And even to this day, barbecue is uh, barbecue pizza is one of our best sellers, one of our signature items. Well, we we can attest well, it was good pizza. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now we're sitting inside a room that's kind of uh, closed off. The doors are closed. It's uh, to the side and. There's a reason for that. It looks like it was someone's favorite room. Could you tell us a little about this room? Yeah, back in the 70s, uh, Elvis came in several times. And uh, this is where he used to sit. We used to close off the doors. And uh, it would be pretty pretty private for him back here in his, his entourage. And uh, that's where he would eat back in this room. Yeah. It's you never knew uh, he, he, if he was sitting down eating, there would be a bunch of people wanting to run up and get his autograph and things like that. You know, it, that would be kind of hard for him if he didn't have this That's right. privacy. Uh, yeah. I mean, we didn't have too much of that problem with the doors closed. They pretty much, people respected his privacy. Uh, what did he like to eat in an Italian restaurant? Mm -hmm. The barbecue pizza is normally what uh, they would eat. Priscilla would usually come in uh, the restaurant uh, at least once a week and bring pizza back to Graceland. That's, a, that's quite a bit of business there. Yeah, well, see, you usually get two or three large ones and uh, um, they had a charge account with us and we would send them a bill. Was that, was that unusual to have a charge account in a restaurant? Well, yeah, somewhat, uh, but uh, and when Elvis well, something you do what they want. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Elvis tended to get what he wanted in Memphis, that's, that's for right. certain. He ordered ravioli. It was very embarrassing. We were out of ravioli. Oh, no. <laughs> you can't do that when he's here. <laughs> so uh, I call that one of my top ten embarrassing moments in the restaurant. Oh, no. Uh, we were out of ravioli, uh, but Elvis was very gracious. He said, well, bring me a plate of spaghetti. Oh, I'm looking around the room today and I see a lot of interesting things on the wall. It's very tastefully done. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the room looks like today. It's a yeah, well, uh, actually we didn't decorate it for years because, uh, well, we kept getting more and more Elvis fans wanting to eat where Elvis ate. Right. And it kept growing and growing. So we need to uh, decorate this room so the fans will have something to look at while they're eating dinner in here. And a friend of mine, Calvin Hicks, and uh, another friend, Tom uh, Caps, helped decorate this room with all the Elvis uh, pictures and uh, 
and paper clippings and record covers and records and uh, there's some quite unique things in here. There sure is. The yeah. over there were, were done uh, by Calvin and uh, we get a lot of compliments on those. Oh, uh, beautiful. There's, there's a, you have some really interesting pieces here. There's one that um, is actually part of a very sad day, August 16, 1977. You have a document from the Memphis Fire Department. Uh, they it's a operated copy of the document. They they operated the ambulance service, so they had to write down uh, whenever they made a call and who they picked up and what what took place. So you actually have that document in where they transferred them from Graceland to Baptist Hospital. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's an artifact. It's of a sad day. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well, Jerry, how did Elvis pick uh, your family's restaurant? Well, I know uh, uh, several times George Klein would bring him in. Uh, George was, had been a regular customer of ours, come in just about every week. And uh, I, he still is today. He comes to our Appling store location just about every Sunday night. Oh, yeah, okay. Still, yeah. 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 And also, uh, uh, some of Elvis's bodyguards would come in and eat with us. So I'm sure it was from them the recommending uh, the place that uh, Elvis got the idea to come here and started trying our pizza in the first place. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 Uh, how far is this from Graceland? Yeah, we're not far, uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. It's just down the street, about 15 minutes away. Uh, now, Jerry, in this day, you have a different set of customers come in here, Elvis fans. You get quite a few of those. Every year we get more and more Elvis fans come in, uh, uh, and they come from all over the world. It's amazing. Uh, a lot of them from Great Britain, from uh, Germany, uh, uh, Scotland. Uh, just uh, it's amazing. People Elvis was loved by people all over the world, right. and they like to eat where Elvis ate. Oh sure. And there's yeah. not too many places left <laughs> that have survived this long. Actually, yeah, that's true. They're not. No, you're not. Yeah, you're so we get people from all over the world come in, and it's and it's interesting to talk to them and uh, find out their experiences. It's very it's very interesting. Yeah, you can tell Elvis is loved around the world. He is. He really yeah. is. Well, Jerry, thank you for letting us in here, and uh, thank Diane as well. No, well, thank you for coming. We enjoyed your visit. We enjoyed your company and your pizza. Thank you. Uh, we're off now to where Elvis used to ride horses. So we're going to take a little drive, get out of the city for a few minutes, go out in the country and see Elvis's ranch, the Circle G Ranch. About to leave Memphis uh, into uh, Mississippi, DeSoto County, Mississippi. We're pretty much following the path Elvis would have taken on um, Highway 55 South. And Elvis bought the ranch in DeSoto County, Mississippi because it was out in the country. It was a retreat from the city, a place he could go away from the noise and confusion. And the ranch is still there, but of course the area has changed and we'll get a look around here in just a few minutes. A lot of folks have actually moved from Memphis into Mississippi and it's become, DeSoto County has become a suburb and to my right is the state sign. Exit South Haven Horn Lake. The ranch is actually in Horn Lake, Mississippi. And in front of me um, on my left side is the New Baptist Hospital hospital company where Elvis uh, had his medical stays and of course uh, where he was taken on the day he died. He was taken to a Baptist Hospital in Memphis. This is Baptist Hospital in DeSoto County. Again, Elvis wouldn't have seen any of this if he, when he came down here in uh, 1967. He would have seen a, a lot of farms. There were very few people that lived in DeSoto County then. Uh, it was very quiet, peaceful. Somewhere around here on the left side of my left, driver's left, will be the ranch property. The other side, you can see all the development that's taken place down through the years. So, you know, Elvis's former ranch is not an isolated, you know, rural area any longer. 
This is probably one of the last pieces of undeveloped land along this road. We're in Horn Lake, Mississippi. All around me is Elvis's Ranch Circle G. This house to my right is what we call the Honeymoon Cottage. This is a building that was existing on the ranch when Elvis bought it. And of course Elvis and Priscilla were married in Las Vegas. They spent part of their honeymoon in Palm uh, Springs, California. Then they came here to the Circle G. So that's why we call this the Honeymoon Cottage. Now it's an interesting story how Elvis bought this ranch. He was actually on a Sunday drive in the country and he spotted a 40-foot cross standing next to a grove of trees. And he said, I've got to see this place. And he drove up, found the owner of the ranch. The ranch really wasn't for sale, but Elvis was persuasive and the guy saw a sweet deal coming. <laughs> so he sold this property to Elvis for a lot of money, I understand it. Today that cross is still here, but you can't see it. It's covered up by the trees, the trees have grown taller, and the foliage is out, so that cross is just not visible to us. But you know, Elvis never did anything halfway. It was either nothing or everything. So he jumped into the ranching business full time. He bought cattle, he bought horses, he bought saddles, he built buildings, people to take care of the animals. And then he decided that all the Memphis Mafia should live here too, should have homes here. So he bought trailers and the trailers were installed on the other side of the property. He bought trucks so they could all have ranching trucks. It was all quite expensive, which made his father nervous, but that's what Elvis wanted. When he wanted something, he did it completely the whole way. Now, unfortunately, Elvis didn't keep the ranch very long. Just as their marriage uh, lasted only a few years after Priscilla left Elvis, he lost interest in the ranch and he sold it. Now some of the Memphis Mafia lived on the ranch. All of them visited the ranch and one of those visitors was George Klein. So we're going to go back to Memphis now and talk to George in just a couple of minutes. We don't know what's going to come of the ranch. There's been various plans announced, proposals, uh, but nothing's happened. Um, there was one group that had promised a big tourist attraction here, and the town of Horn Lake was thrilled. Turns out they had no money. There's also a question, at least in my mind, I'm not certain, of the ownership of the ranch. Uh, the owner for the last uh, two decades uh, was about 90 years old when he passed away and apparently there's a, a dispute among the heirs over who has title to it and who has a decision-making authority and until that's all sorted out then really nothing's going to happen to the ranch but what I fear is is once the legalities are cleared up then the land will be sold to a real estate developer and they'll turn it into another subdivision Hopefully, they'll take some of that land and turn it into a park. Uh, I think that would be nice. I know it's a place that the fans will always want to go to. We're here to meet George Klein. He's one of Elvis's best friends, and he's agreed to talk to us for a few minutes. George, thanks for letting us into your home. Okay, bye. Come on in. Sure. No problem. I'll give you a quick rundown. Elvis and I met in high school, 1948, Humes High School. Elvis had just moved up from uh, Tupelo, Mississippi, and enrolled in our high school. Ironically and coincidentally, we were in the exact same classes all the way through high school. And where we really bonded was in the eighth grade, <clears throat> we had a music class together. And Elvis brought his guitar uh, to school one day, and the teacher let him do it, and he got up in front of the class and sang two songs. And I'd never seen a 12-year-old play a guitar and sing and I was really uh, blown away. And from that moment on, uh, we were friends, not the best of friends, but good friends. And all the way through high school, we sort of bonded. And uh, when we got out of high school, I went into radio and television. Elvis started recording for Sun Records. And uh, so we had a lot in common at that time. So we hung out a whole lot together yeah. with Elvis, Elvis, Dewey Phillips and I. And uh, then I lost my job <clears throat> once. 
they, they called me in and they said, George, we don't think this rock and roll thing is going to last. We think it's a fad. So they let me go, station in Memphis. And uh, so I went to work with Elvis, traveled with him, went to Hawaii, went to Canada, went out to Hollywood to make the movie Jailhouse, excuse me, Jailhouse Rock. Yeah. Uh, went down to New Orleans with him for King Creole. Right. And then uh, he went in the Army. I went back into radio and TV. He gets out of the Army. He offers me carte blanche to be with him at any time. And I would schedule my vacation time as to when he was shooting a motion picture. And then I'd go out to Hollywood and hang with him for two or three weeks. And I was in eight of his movies, merely as an extra bit part, silent bit, whatever you want to call it. But I was in there. And uh, then when Elvis got married, I was one of 14 people at the wedding. There was a lot of people downstairs at the reception area, but I was at the actual wedding yeah. in the room with him. I flew over with Elvis. Uh, it was Elvis, Priscilla, me, Joe Esposito, and Joe's wife, Joni, and the two pilots. We flew from Palm Springs, California, and Frank Sinatra's Lear Jet. And then the rest of the entourage came over, but they flew in another plane. I was fortunate enough that Elvis wanted me to fly with him. I was very honored. And I was a groomsman at his wedding. Then, not shortly thereafter, a couple of years later, when I got married, uh, he was the best man at my wedding and paid for my entire wedding. Then, when Elvis, uh, when Elvis passed away, I was a, a, a Paul Bear at his funeral. I was at the right front of the casket. And then, uh, I think 14 years ago, whenever they started the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Elvis's family asked me to go to New York, to Waldorf Astoria, and represent him and make a speech for him and accept his award into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which was quite a thrill for me. And since then, I've been doing my own thing, and uh, I'm on Sirius Satellite Radio, as you know, Mike. Uh, right. Every Friday, I do a nationwide show on Channel 13, the Elvis Channel. Uh, I record locally. Well, I don't record locally. I'll do a, an Elvis Hour on the local AM station in Memphis, which is rebroadcast on Sirius. I have a new TV show. Well, it's new. It's been on the air three years now in Memphis. It's called Memphis Sounds with George Klein. It's about Memphis music. And uh, I'm with the Horseshoe Casino, as you can see. There you go. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm down there. I do a public relations, hosting type, bit greeter type thing for them. I haven't been down there for 12 years. That, that really pays the bills, and uh, they're really a wonderful organization. So you were with Elvis, really, from almost the beginning. The to, only two guys with Elvis from the beginning were me and Red West. That's right. Red was there with us in high school. Red was there. I was there. The rest of the guys joined us later on. Later on. But, uh, yeah, I was there from... <laughs> Uh, actually, I was there before Red because I was there from 1948 in the yeah. eighth grade. Red came in aboard about the 10th, 11th grade. Now, let me ask you some questions. Besides the, the musical talent, what one thing or two things struck you about Elvis in high school? What made him different from the, all the other guys? Well, <clears throat> you, you can't over, I know you say besides the talent, you can't overlook the talent because oh, no. you, you could actually see he would bring his guitar to school and sing. And, and, and each year he got better and better. And uh, it culminated at the high school talent show. We had a senior class talent show, and I was president of the senior class. Yeah. And uh, so I put together the talent show, and Elvis won it. And from that moment on, I said, well, you know what? Maybe he's got a chance. But to what he stood out in high school, today the young people, they wear, they wear piercings, and they color their hair weird colors, and they wear tattoos all over their body. Elvis did, we were trying to stand out too. And the way you stood out in high school back in 1953 when we graduated, or 52, whatever, <clears throat> uh, was that you were an athlete, if you were a star athlete, or if you were big in high school politics, if, or you were a cheerleader, or you had won some kind of award, that made you stand out. Elsewhere, then you had to do something to stand out. And Elvis did his own thing. He dressed differently. He'd wear back a black pair of pants with a white stripe down the side. He'd wear a sport coat to school and turn a collar up. Nobody wore sport coats to school. Elvis would, uh, you know, had the long, his hair was longer. Excuse me, if you will. Elvis's hair was longer when he graduated from high school than the Beatles were when they came out to America in 64. Wow. Elvis uh, had long hair, had side burns, dressed differently. Uh, but he, but you, you know what? He was, he was like a velvet hammer. He did it in a quiet sort of way. He didn't offend anybody with it. Yeah, I've heard he was called a teacher's pet. He was actually nice to the teachers. He was nice to everybody. Elvis yeah. was a nice guy, yeah. Yeah. Now, you were friends with Dewey Phillips, and so was Elvis. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I knew Dewey before Elvis because I had worked at HBQ. I was a part-timer at WHBQ, as that's where I broke into radio. And uh, uh, Dewey was an unusual guy. He was a very good disc jockey in his own way, but he had an unorthodox style on the air. 
sort of a country rock and roll style and uh, had a lot of pet sayings like tell him Philip sent you and call Sam. He'd blood out these crazy words on the air. He would, he would interrupt records on the air and talk over them and do crazy things. Uh, he was a crazy disc jockey, but a very talented jock. It was crazy, but it was organized crazy. <laughs> and, and he knew what he was doing. And, but Dewey Phillips' greatest talent was he had a great ear for music. And one of the best ears I'd ever seen for music. He, could, he couldn't spot ever if it was going to be a hit, but he could tell you if it had a shot. And back in those days, we didn't have music directors at the station. You'd pick your own music. And so Dewey, by picking his own music, he was playing the right records, and the kids started listening to him. And that's what I picked up from Dewey. I started doing the same thing. You worked for Elvis. I remember you telling me a story that you got to spend the night in his house. Why don't you tell me that? Yeah, well, I, I spent many nights at Ottoman Drive and Graceland. And uh, when, the night that I got fired at the radio station, I mean, the day that I got fired, then that, that was the night I ran into Elvis and he hired me. Well, we, 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 after Dewey signed off, we went down to the Variety Club and goofed around. After that, we drove around looking for girls and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> and then we went on out to uh, Ottoman Drive. Of course, there was a lot of girls out there waiting on us. Always. <laughs> because, you know, as you know, Mike, you own that house. And what the, the fence was only what two or three feet high. Oh, uh, they, they jump over the fence and come to the door and knock on the side of the house. He did everything. Well, anyway, <clears throat> uh, it was getting very late, three or four or five o'clock in the morning. And I said, Elvis, I got to go home. And he said, Well, man, you live on the other side of town. I live by Hume's High School. And he said, uh, Why don't you spend the night with me? I said, Okay. So uh, I spent the night with Elvis there at Ottoman Drive. And, and as you know, his mom and dad was in one room. Grandma Presley was in the other room, so the other bedroom was Elvis's room. So right. I, I had to bunk up with Elvis. And I'll never forget it, because we, I was so excited about going to Hollywood, I couldn't sleep. And uh, we talked for about a couple hours before we went to sleep. And, and I'd hear <coughs> knocking on the side of the wall. And I said, Elvis, what is that? He said, that's teenagers. They just jump the wall and they're knocking. And they'd say, Elvis, Elvis, we love you. Elvis, uh, can we come in? Elvis, can we have an autograph? Elvis, uh, I love Heartbreak Hotel. Elvis loved this and that. And they were, and all night long, the kids were out there. And it's, you know, finally the police would come by and run them away. Or the next door neighbor would shoo them away from their side of the house. But uh, that was, uh, I'll never forget that night, spending that night at all. But that happened several times after that. I would be there and... And Elvis would say, just stay here, GK. I don't want to drive you all the way home. I didn't have a car, see. So, uh, so I'd bunk up with Elvis. And he'd drive me home the next day or something. And then I'd come back that night and we'd party, you know. But it was, uh, I had some good memories from Audubon Drive. 1034, right? Yeah, 1034, 1034 Audubon Drive. Drive. The swimming pool parties, uh, the shooting light bulbs in the pool as he knew he was going to be selling uh, the, the house. Did you clean up all that glass out of the pool? Uh, yeah, eventually I did, yeah. We, I don't know how he got on this kick, but... Somehow or another, Elvis found out that if you take flash bulbs, they don't have flash bulbs anymore for no, cameras. No, no, they don't. But if you take flash bulbs and you throw them in a swimming pool, they'll float. And if you take a BB gun and you shoot them, they flare up like a, like a, like a oh, flare. Yeah. And we would do that. So he would go to the drugstore or the department store, and we'd buy a lot of flash bulbs, and we'd throw them in the pool. Then we had these BB guns, we'd shoot them, and they'd pop, and it was really was kind of pretty. Well, we... One day we shot, we busted so many, <laughs> Mr. Presley, helped us his father, got really upset because the next day he had to clean out the pool. <laughs> That's right. And uh, <laughs> That's the problem with those games, yeah, you know, <laughs> someone had to clean up after. <laughs> I wondered who cleaned it up after he moved, but uh, what, uh, what really I don't understand, Mike, is why, other than maybe an insurance reason, they filled in the pool and painted it over to make it look like a pool. Uh, I don't know why. I, it's not something. Is that I, what you told me? They painted it over to make it look like no, a pool. No, they they tore the pool apart. They, it's gone. They destroyed it. I thought they just filled it in. I, they were supposed to just fill it in and leave the concrete intact. Yeah. And they destroyed it. It's gone. As far What's as I know, now? I don't know. I've not been back there. I've only seen it. The house. That's in the a street. historic home. You know, I came out there when you were there and yeah. talked to the fans and a lot of wonderful memories. Uh, it is. A, it was. It was amazing how you guys had restored the house like it, it looked. You yeah, know. we tried to. I mean, it's a yeah. historic property. I, I hate it that they, yeah, they messed up the pool. Thank goodness Mike Curb, this big record executive, who you know very more better than I do, yeah. but I do know Mike, uh, from Nashville, came in and saved it and donated it to Rhodes College or something? Yeah, he did. He bought it to, to donate to Rhodes College. It was his intention to let the college use it for their school of music. Uh, how exactly they're going to use it, we don't know yet. But 
Let me ask you this, At least it'll be saved. Let me ask it, it's not the biggest house on the street. No. Because I noticed the other, when I was there last time, before I looked at those houses, but everybody looked at Elvis's house. They didn't care about the other houses. But no. now I started looking at the other house. And I noticed some of those houses probably not worth eight or nine hundred thousand or a million dollars. I mean, uh, they're beautiful homes on that street. Yeah, there are. They're beautiful homes. They've been, uh, and they're bigger than the Elvis's house. Some yeah. of them have been added on to. Uh, but his house is deceptive now. It looks small from the street, and people say, oh, tell me that all the time. But if you go in the back, you know, it goes back and yeah, back yeah. and back and back. It's bigger he added than that think. den on, didn't he? He added the big yeah, den, yeah. what we call the big game room. Uh, and so it's, it's 3,000 square feet. That's a pretty good size home. So. Yeah, you know what I noticed about that house, and I noticed it about Graceland, Mike, is that the two homes that, that I remember mostly with Elvis, especially other than the ones in Hollywood, Perigee Away in Hollywood was like this. His homes had a real comfortable feeling about them. When you yeah. walked in, you felt comfortable. You felt relaxed. It had a, a cozy feeling about them. Uh, yeah. Audubon Drive and Graceland. Yeah, that's the thing about Graceland. Uh, people do tours. They say, gosh, it's small. The rooms are small. Well, yeah, that was know, 30 years ago. Yeah, you know, it's not a monster sized home. I mean, it's, it's big enough for a few people to live comfortably. Yeah, yeah. So it's, well, there was 18 wanted, rooms right? originally in Graceland. I don't know what's there now, but yeah. it's 18 rooms. And I used to stay, when I was spunk out at Graceland, I would stay in the bedroom next to Elvis' room, which is now he made into a closet. Yeah. It's not open to the public, yeah. but uh, yeah. that's where I'd stay. Yeah. Now, we've often been told that uh, because of fame and, uh, and just the musician's lifestyle, he would do things at night and sleep in the day. And we. Um, We've heard about this theater called the Memphian. That was one of his favorite places. The Memphian to go. Theater was was a great venue for us. Uh, <clears throat> we lucked into that. There was a guy named uh, Mr. Uh, gosh, what was his name? I'll think of him in a minute. Uh, anyway, this gentleman who was the city manager for the theaters for Malco, which owned the Memphian, and a bunch of other theaters in town. Yeah. And the Lightmans still own all those theaters, except I think they sold the Memphian or gave it to the city or something. They gave it to the Playhouse and the Square yeah. folks. Well. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Schaefer was his name, Paul Schaefer. Paul Schaefer was a friend, somehow or another, of Vernon Presley. Oh. We found out that he was the general manager, I mean, the, the city manager of all the theaters. And we said, Elvis asked him, he said, Mr. Schaefer, he said, uh, you think you could fix it up where I could rent the Memphian Theater over there or rent one of your theaters all, where we can show screen movies at night? And Mr. Schaefer said, yeah, let me talk to the Lightmans. And they said, sure. So the Memphian was not downtown, it was centrally located. It was probably the closest house, the closest theater to Graceland, where we wouldn't have to drive far, yeah. and uh, wouldn't attract much of attention. So we started renting that. I say we Elvis did. And gosh, we rented that theater for many years and would show movies all night long. Elvis was a movie fan. Yes, yes. Into being a movie star, and we showed movies all night long. First run movies, before the movies even hit the street, we would show them over there, and we usually would start showing them about midnight because the theater was open. It was a the theater that. And the last movie would end about 10, 30, 11, and Elvis would come in around midnight, and we'd show movies to 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, a lot of wonderful times about that Memphian Theater. A lot of great memories because, uh, well, you, you'd see the movies before they came out. Also, if Elvis didn't like a movie, he would just tell the projectionist to stop the movie, you know. Or if he, <laughs> if he wanted to see another scene, he said, would you rewind that? I'll look at that again. <laughs> you couldn't do that in a movie theater, you know. No, no. Uh -uh. And uh, we had food there. The, the candy counter and the popcorn counter would stay open, and then Elvis would send out for hamburgers or hot dogs, or whatever. And, and it was uh, it was just a neat way to watch movies. Yeah. Uh, especially then we could say, "Hey, I, I just saw the new movie before it came out." Tell all of your friends, you know, you got to yeah. see this picture and all of that, or oh. don't see this picture because it's not any good. But uh, the Memphian was a that was where I that was the Memphian Theater was where I introduced Elvis to Linda Thompson. Oh. That happened there. Uh, what else happened over there, historic? Uh, I'm trying well, to think. A lot of people have talked about the Memphian Theater, that they saw movies there with Elvis. I know Jerry Schilling's talked about that quite a bit. Yeah, well, what would happen was Elvis had his inner circle of friends. We didn't call ourselves the Memphis Mafia. And uh, <clears throat> so we would ask Elvis, Elvis, is it okay if my buddy comes in and his girlfriend? And he'd say, sure. So, you know, he had eight or ten guys, so they would bring their friends, and then we would have friends, and Elvis would have friends, so that we would get anywhere from anywhere from 10 to 12 to 15 to 20 people watching a movie at night. Yeah. Over there. Yeah. That's how so many people got to go in. Yeah. We'd ask Elvis and uh, Elvis had his favorite row where he sat. He said about, he said center section, 
about 10 or 12 rows back, and you didn't sit, he didn't like anybody sit in front of him. Oh no, didn't do and, that. And uh, so we all would sit in the back. Actually, Alan Fortis, myself, we would always sit way back. We'd sit back near the door uh, because we'd sneak out about four or five in the morning. We had to work the next day and he didn't. <laughs> So we would sneak out. We'd bail out after about a couple of movies. Yeah, a real job, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, plus the restroom was back there, and uh, we could talk and not disturb him if we were sitting that far back, you know. Mm -hmm.